my name is Grace Hayek, and on behalf of the Glencoe Public Library, I welcome you to tonight's webinar with author, entomologist, and environmental leader, Doug Ptolemy, who will tell us about his newest initiative, Homegrown National Park. Tonight's program is presented in partnership with the Friends of the Green Bay Trail and the Glencoe Sustainability Task Force. Special thanks go out to Meredith Clement for her work in helping schedule this event. Thank you, Meredith. Now, I'd like to introduce our presenter. Douglas Ptolemy is the T.A. Baker Professor of Agriculture in the Department of Entomology and Wildlife Ecology at the University of Delaware, where he's authored 112 research publications and has taught insect-related courses for 42 years. One of his top research goals is to better understand the many ways insects interact with plants and how such interactions determine the diversity of animal communities. His book, Bringing Nature Home, was published in 2007 and was awarded the Silver Medal by the Garden Writers Association. The Living Landscape, co-authored with Rich Dark, was published in 2014. Nature's Best Hope, a New York Times bestseller, was released in 2020. And his latest book, The Nature of Oaks, was released in March 2021. We were very glad to host, host him here in September 2021 for a program around the nature of oaks, and we're delighted that he agreed to return. Doug, it's great to have you here tonight to discuss the Homegrown National Park Project, and I will let you take it from here. Well, thank you very much, Grace. <clears throat> it is a pleasure to be here tonight. I'm in Southeast Pennsylvania, and it's very smoky outside, so uh, good time to sit inside and do a webinar. All right, uh, Homegrown National Park, let's, let's start with this picture. That looks very much like a fecal sac uh, that a bird has dropped on a leaf. You know, birds in, in nests don't want their babies pooping in the nest. So the babies offer up uh, their poops all wrapped up in a little sack and the, the parents take that sack, fly off and just drop it. And it usually splats on a leaf and looks very much like that. Well, that's actually a spider, which is trying to look like a, a fecal sac because nothing wants to eat a, a fecal sac. Uh, it's a bolus spider. And it looks much more like a spider at night when it comes off of its leaf and it hangs down. <clears throat> it does not make a web. It hunts with a single strand of silk with one sticky glob of glue down there, which it raises up and down. Uh, and the idea is that a prey item is going to fly in and get, get caught on that sticky glob of glue. And surprisingly, they do. They're moths. Uh, and the spider will very quickly spin it around and wrap it up with silk uh, so that it's helpless. And then she'll she'll feed on it and she'll catch moth after moth uh, and and have a lot of good meals. Then she she cuts it free and it falls to the ground. And when she gets enough energy, she can spin a uh, this is a sack that contains her egg. So an egg sack. And that's how they overwinter in this egg sack. And if hunting is very good, she can make two or three egg sacs. Now you might wonder why a moth flies into that single target. Um, the first time I met one of these uh, spiders in my yard, I, I told her, you're not going to catch anything. Uh, but she did. And she did because she's actually releasing the sex pheromone of particular species of moths. Uh, so the moths that come in and get stuck here are males that think she is a female. Well, I was interested in which species of moth she was actually attracting. And in my yard, it is the bronze cutworm. I unwound the uh, the little bodies that she dropped and it was the bronze cutworm. And I have bronze cutworm adults in my yard because I've got bronze cutworm larvae, caterpillars in my yard. And I've got the caterpillars because I've got a lot of goldenrod and that's their, their primary host plant. I also had this beautiful moth, the dot line white, uh, because I've got oak trees, particularly white oak trees. They love them. And because they don't rake the leaves away from underneath those, those trees. There is a dot line white cocoon in this picture. And I bet you can't see it. It's right there. And when it's enlarged, it's still hard to see. And there's no way when we're raking the leaves away from, from our plants that we're ever going to see cocoons like that. So be uh, keep in mind, when you throw your leaves away, you're throwing away a lot of living organisms as well. I've got evening primrose moths in my yard because I've got evening primrose. And I've got evening primrose because I, I planted it. And the moths come and they spend the day with their heads stuffed in the flowers. And sometimes it's crowded, but it is always very cute. I've got uh, zebra swallowtails because I planted pawpaws. I did it specifically to attract that, that beautiful swallowtail. It's my favorite swallowtail. Um, it took nine years for them to find my, my pawpaws, but they did. And now I've got a good population of them. Uh, it would actually take me a long time to describe all of the species that now call 
uh, our property home. And they call our property home because we put the plants that they need in our landscape. It would not take me very long to describe all the things that are happening in this landscape, a very typical suburban landscape. They don't have any goldenrod, so they don't have any bronze cutworms, so they don't have any bola spiders. They don't have any uh, oak trees, so they don't have any dot line whites. They don't have any evening primrose, so they don't have the evening primrose moth. They don't have pawpaws, so they don't have zebra swallowtails, on and on and on. Uh, and that is typical of what's happening in 135 million acres of residential landscapes uh, across our, our country. Uh, they are not designed to support biodiversity. Uh, and it's one of the reasons we're seeing um, some terrible headlines, like the insect apocalypse is here, we're talking about global insect decline. North America has lost 3 billion breeding birds in the last 50 years. Uh, that's a third of our North American bird population already gone. Two thirds of Earth's wildlife is already gone. The UN says we're gonna lose a million species to extinction in the next 20 years. 40% of Earth's plants face extinction. Again, we could talk a long time about all the terrible things that are happening to the life on planet Earth. And that is why Elizabeth Colbert gets to write this book, The Sixth Extinction, talking about uh, the, the five big extinctions that have occurred on the planet up till now. And now we are in the middle of the sixth one, but it's the first extinction to be caused by a living being, and that, of course, is us. Uh, well, you know, people are hearing these headlines and they're reacting to them so much so that, that there's actually people studying what our reaction is to biodiversity losses. And Richard Hobbs is one of those people. And he likens to our, our, uh, our, our response to biodiversity loss to the, the five stages of grief that we experience when we hear we have a, a terminal disease. First, there's denial. Uh, and there's certainly a lot of that going on, you know, people saying we don't actually have a problem. Anger, I feel that sometimes. Bargaining, well, well you know, what can we do? Maybe it's not so bad. Depression, that's pretty easy to feel too. And then the fifth stage is acceptance. And this is where I'm going to push back because acceptance is not an option for us. Acceptance is, is equivalent to giving up. Uh, and giving up is not an option because nature is what sustains us on the planet, planet Earth. If we give up, you know, we're done. So let's propose a sixth stage, and that would be action. And the rest of this talk is going to focus on the fact that action will help turn these terrible statistics around. Now, we do have parks. We do have preserves. Uh, our national parks, in particular, were established because they were spectacular places. They held spectacular scenery. Uh, and, and Teddy Roosevelt, of course, expanded the national park system considerably. And he describes it like this, the establishment of, of National Park Service is justified by considerations of good administration. So Teddy's uh, patting himself on the back there, as he should. The value of natural beauty is a national asset and the effectiveness of outdoor life and recreation in the production of good citizenships. So translation is our parks were created because they were pretty places for us to play in. They were not created uh, for conservation. Uh, nobody was thinking about that way back then. Uh, and that's why we only have 3.6% of the U.S. in terms of area preserved in national parks, and only 12% of the U.S. is federally protected. Uh, and, and you've heard what happens to federally protected land. It's federally protected until Congress decides to um, end those protections. So uh, what's happening outside of our protected areas is truly appalling. And again, you've heard these statistics before. Every 30 seconds, a football field worth of America's natural areas disappears to development. Development is the most oxymoronic word in, in all of conservation. Again, 44 million acres of lawn in an area the size of New England. Uh, and, and lawn is an ecological deadscape. We've paved over an area larger than Ohio, and that statistic is 15 years old. So who knows how much it is now? Two million acres of golf courses. That's an area larger than Rhode Island and Delaware combined, dedicated to golf balls. Well, people wonder, and you know, we do have parks, we do have preserves, we've got uh, land conservancies, and, and, and people are trying. Why aren't those areas big enough? Why are they not good enough to preserve the biodiversity that, that sustains us? And there are a number of reasons why they're not good enough, but the big one is they are, they are too small. When you take a large area like this and you shrink it down to a small isolated habitat, and this is an exaggeration, um, you're taking large populations and shrinking them down to small 
populations. That's the problem because small populations are highly vulnerable to local extinction because all populations um, fluctuate. In good times, they go up. and bad times, they go down. That is normal, and it will always happen. If you're a large population, even in your down cycle, there's enough individuals so that you can increase quickly when times get better. If you're a tiny population, though, oftentimes those fluctuations end up uh, with you disappearing. You blink out of your little habitat fragment and then you're, you're gone unless you recolonize it. Uh, and more and more, as our habitats become more and more isolated, it is difficult for animals to recolonize these, these fragments. Picture a, uh, a box turtle crossing a major highway. It just doesn't happen anymore. So that becomes local extinction. And there are studies all over the world um, that demonstrate very clearly that the natural areas we've left on planet Earth are not large enough to sustain the amount of nature that we need to sustain us. And some of these studies are, are more than 100 years old. So the, the data is very, very solid. Now we tend to use extinction as a metric of, of trouble. Uh, and I don't like that because uh, that's like going to the doctor when you're already dead. It's, it's a little late uh, at that point. Um, I think we need to look at the decline of species that were once common. So this is the uh, American chestnut, used to be the dominant tree along the crest of the Appalachians from Maine all the way down to Georgia, uh, an extraordinarily important um, ecological force in our Eastern forests. Uh, so they're not extinct, but they're functionally gone um, because of the chestnut blight. This is the rusty patch bumblebee. You've all heard that the rusty patch bumblebee is in, in big trouble. It used to be one of the most common bees uh, in the entire country. Uh, and now if you find one, it's, it's a big deal. So again, functionally, they are already extinct. Beavers. Now beavers are making a comeback, but they used to be extremely common. They used to determine uh, the quality of the hydrology all over the country, from our largest rivers right down to our smallest streams. Um, beavers manipulated the hydrology. Um, so, so in terms of that, they are, they are gone. Uh, and it has changed the hydrology dramatically in our, our ecosystems. So what we're talking about here is defaunation, not extinction. Uh, these animals, these plants are still around, but they're not around in the numbers they used to be, and they're not contributing to ecosystem function the way they used to. So defaunation uh, is, is the real problem. It's happening everywhere locally and, and uh, not so locally. Uh, and the interesting thing is we don't notice it. And we don't notice it because of a phenomenon called shifting baseline. We tend to think that things are the way they ought to be uh, when they're the way they were when we were kids. So what we experience when we're growing up is normal uh, and, and anything else um, is, is not. So when, you, when we enter this world, that's already defaunated when, when there's already depauperate number of, of species, uh, we think that's normal because we've never known anything else. None of us miss the passenger pigeon because we weren't born, none of us were born uh, before this, this bird, the most common bird in the entire world uh, went extinct. So shifting baseline means that we're losing biodiversity, the biodiversity that sustains us, and we don't even notice it which is why that's the challenge in terms of getting people's attention about how important this issue is. So what should we do? Well, you know, we are making, we are making progress. The UN took it up as a, an issue this year. They had the big meeting in Montreal, I believe it was, talking about the biodiversity crisis. What are we gonna do? But the UN is the UN. And what are they, what are they gonna do? They're gonna pass a resolution. Here's one of the headlines that came out of that meeting. Crucial negotiations to protect biodiversity are moving at a snail's pace. We are negotiating whether or not we're going to protect the stuff that keeps us on this planet. So they can negotiate. We need a little bit faster action than that. Um, Edward O. Wilson, E.O. Wilson from Harvard uh, knew that, and uh, he was concerned about the loss of biodiversity his entire career. In 2016, he wrote this book, Half Earth, Our Planet's Fight for Life, essentially offering it as uh, as the necessary final solution to this biodiversity crisis. The book had one simple message. If we're going to save life anywhere on planet Earth, and that includes human life, we have to save nature. We have to save functioning ecosystems on at least half of the planet. Otherwise, it's going to disappear everywhere. And he took, he spent most of the book talking about the science that supports that very bold statement. 
And then he ended the book. He did not spend a lot of time telling us how we were going to save life on half of planet Earth. Of course, to a conservation biologist, that's that's great news. We'll just put half the Earth aside and all those things that are suffering and disappearing can be in that half and, and we'll be in the other half. Problem is half of terrestrial Earth is already in some form of, of agriculture. I don't see that disappearing very quickly. We've got 8 billion people in the other half, along with all of our, our uh, hardscape, all of our infrastructure, our detritus, airports, and so on. And we don't have a third half to put aside for nature. So, of course, everybody's wondering how we can realize E.O. Wilson's dream. I think we can. I really do think we can. But we need a new approach to conservation to do that. The old approach was uh, based on the notion that humans and nature cannot coexist. We can't be in the same place at the same time. We got to give give up with that um, because we don't have that third third half of the earth to put aside. We're going to have to co coexist. So what I argue all the time is that that not only is living with nature an option, it's now the only viable option that's left to us. In the past, of course, conservation has worked pretty much exclusively where there weren't a lot of people. We now need to turn that on its head. We have to practice conservation where there are a lot of people because that's pretty much everywhere. So we're not just going to do conservation here where there's still a lot of nature left. We got to do it here where we've gotten rid of it. We've got to put it back. And that means we've got to find ways for nature to thrive in human dominated landscapes, not hang on by a thread, but actually thrive. Now, a lot of people talk about uh, habitat fragmentation as being the problem. So you have isolated habitats and in between those habitats, you've got no man's land, nothing, nothing can exist. And they say, we need to build biological carters. We need to connect these habitat fragments so that plants and animals can move from one fragment to the other. So these are, that's why they call them corridors. They're not places where they can live. They're just avenues where they can move. So picture a mountain lion moving between habitats or birds or some, some other things. Um, I don't think that's going to solve the problem because the populations within these habitat fragments are till, still tiny. They'll still fluctuate and they still will disappear. So I'm proposing that we create viable habitat outside of these habit, of these fragments so that animals and plants actually can live outside of the protected fragments. This is even better. You can picture the, uh, the light areas as being our cities and some of our agriculture, but we want to put as many plants back in between the protected areas so that not only are they connected, we've got um, viable habitat outside these areas. And every bit of conservation that we do outside of a protected area helps conservation inside that protected area because it enlarges the populations that are within them. To achieve this, though, we need to adjust our attitude about property rights. Uh, we do have this idea that um, our our property is it belongs to us and we can do anything, anything we want to it. Uh, there's a big problem with that, and that is that our yards are not like Las Vegas. Uh, you know that what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas. Uh, well, what happens on our yards, on our properties, does not stay on our properties. And that's a huge difference. And it's something most people don't think much about. Our properties are all part of local ecosystems. So whatever we do on that property is going to impact that ecosystem, either positively or negatively. Let's just talk about lawn. The amount of lawn you have is gonna determine whether rain infiltrates uh, and, and recharges the water table or whether it leaves a stormwater runoff. It's going to influence whether you're adding pollutants to our watershed, nitrogen and phosphorus and herbicides and insecticides that wash off with uh, that, that rain. That's gonna determine how much carbon you're adding to the atmosphere every time you mow your lawn. It's also gonna determine how well pollinators do in that space. Um, how you treat your landscape is going to determine whether you can have uh, viable populations of, of, of complex communities of, of pollinators. How we landscape is going to determine how much carbon we're actually sequestering, not adding to the atmosphere, but pulling out of the atmosphere. Because, of course, plants build their tissues out of carbon, the carbon they get from carbon dioxide. And they also pump 
extra carbon into the soil through their root system. And that's why soils are brown or black. It's carbon that plant roots have deposited over the eon. So the plant choices we use on our property are gonna determine how well we do that. It's also gonna determine whether we're harboring ecological tumors, all of those invasive ornamentals. This is calorie pear. Um, you know what it is. We've got privet and burning bush and barberry and ailanthus and, and buckthorn and, and all kinds of things we've brought in uh, ornamentally that are now escaping, replacing the native plants in our, our local ecosystems with plants from other countries that are very poor at passing on energy. So in short, our plant choices are going to determine um, how well we're supporting the food web. We've got to pick plants that are going to create the insects, support the insects that then other creatures need to reproduce and, and simply exist. Our landscapes are going to determine how much life Earth can sustain, at least where we, we are. Uh, and that is an awesome responsibility of people who manage those landscapes, typical homeowners. It's an awesome responsibility, and they don't know that they have it. It also creates a grassroots solution to the biodiversity crisis, though. There are a lot of us. What do we have in this country? 335 million people or something. Um, and, and hundreds of millions of them own property, and they can influence what's happening on that property. That is going to be the solution to biodiversity crisis, at least in this country. Remember, most of the land is privately owned, 78%. Of the country is privately owned. Over 85% east of the Mississippi is privately owned. If we don't practice conservation on those private properties, we're going to fail. So collectively, prop property owners are now the hope and the future of conservation. And again, I can't stress it enough. Most of them don't know that. We've got to get that message to them. Back to lawn. It is the low-hanging fruit. It's the easiest thing to modify. We don't need to get permission to do it. Again, we've got a lot of it. The latest stat I've heard is 44 million acres. Uh, way back in 2005, Malesi and all ordered uh, or measured 40 million acres um, dedicated to an ecological deadscape. And we do that because it's a status symbol. It's a measure of, of uh, you know, our, our, uh, the quality of our citizenship. Um, and we also have to display our Halloween decorations. So, but what if we cut that area in half? If we replanted half the area that is now in lawn? Let's say we've got 40 million acres, we're gonna cut it in half. That'll give us 20 million acres uh, that we can do practice restoration on right where we live. It's enough to create what I am calling homegrown national park, a new national park that would be bigger than the Adirondacks plus Yellowstone, plus Yosemite, plus Grand Tetons, Canyonland, Mount Rainier, North Cascades, Badlands National Park, Olympic National Park, Sequoia National Park, plus the Grand Canyon, plus Denali, which is huge, plus the Great Smoky Mountains. Add up all those parks, it's still less than 20 million acres. So Homegrown National Park will be the biggest park in the country. I had that idea in, uh, I think it was around 2007 when I heard about that, that statistic. Uh, and I started talking about it in my talks. You've all heard about it in the past, I'm sure. When I wrote Nature's Best Hope, I included a chapter dedicated to Homegrown National Park. But that was pretty much my contribution. I just do a lot of talking. Um, I met a woman named uh, Michelle Alfandari who uh, said, you know, if you don't get this idea to the masses outside the, the choir, uh, it's not going to work. And she said that requires social media. It requires current methods of mass communication. And I said, you know, I don't, I don't do all that. And she said, well, I do do it. And we, we joined up, teamed up to make uh, homegrownnationalpark.org. Um, that is our website. And we have a small nonprofit uh, designed to do exactly that, to get this message to all the people who, who don't, don't know about it, who don't know that they're the future of conservation. We've got the idea of the map here. You can join Homegrown National Park for free. Register your property on the map. Uh, so location, where it is, and then the amount of your property that you're going to be a good steward of. Maybe you really are going to reduce the area of lawn. Uh, you know, if you, if you do it by half, that's great. If you do it by one foot, that's that's a start. Maybe you're going to plant an oak tree. Maybe you're going to put an aster in a flower pot. Whatever you do counts, then your little piece of your county is going to light up. You're a member of Homegrown National Park. You'll get to see who else is a home, member of Homegrown National Park in your county. And the object is to get the entire country to light up. Uh, there's a bit of competition here in that states are color-coded by their level of participation. The darker green you are, 
um, the better you're doing. Uh, it's a proportion of your, your population. Uh, so that, uh, that can stimulate competition among states. That's the hope anyway. Um, what are we asking? You know, we're trying to create this grassroots movement that will solve the, it's science-based. We're trying to solve the, the biodiversity crisis right at home. We do want people to reduce the area that's in lawn because lawn is not accomplishing any of the ecological goals our landscapes have. We're gonna put more native in our yards. We're gonna choose the species that do accomplish those goals. Very important, we wanna remove the invasive plants that are there right now. Most people do have invasive species on their property, either on the edges and they're not thinking about it, or as ornamentals that uh, are features of their, their property. Again, these are ecological tumors. Um, it's, it's high priority, get rid of those. If 85% of the countries uh, east of the Mississippi is privately owned and everybody removes all the invasives from their private property, we're 85% done. So all you have to worry about is your property. If your property is protecting any natural areas, you wanna certainly continue to do that. There are important ecological products associated with homegrown national park significant increases in biodiversity. And I'll give you some stats in a, in a few minutes. Um, and, and when we get rid of those invasive species, that's a measurable reduction in the invasive species problem. If you convert lawn into uh, a planting like this or simply plant a tree, there is a, a measurable significant drawdown of atmospheric CO2. So you're helping climate change and you're starting to transform areas outside of, of the parks and preserves into viable habitat. Sociological products are important too. We're trying to create national awareness, not just of what the problem is, but what the solutions are. If we all understand what the solutions are, we can, we can craft policies to support those solutions. Uh, we're trying to change the culture, in, in fact. We want people to recognize that nature's, it's not just there for our entertainment. Um, it's not optional. We're, it's essential. We depend on it. And because everybody depends on functioning ecosystems, it is everybody's responsibility to keep those ecosystems functioning, not just the tree huggers. We want to convert hope into action. Hope is good, but action is even better. And we want to merge all of the, the existing national uh, conservation organizations. There's a lot of them. A lot of people practicing conservation out there, all the Audubon members, National Wildlife Federation, Wild Ones, Sierra Club, land conservancies all over the place doing wonderful things on private property, but nobody's measuring that. We wanna get all those properties onto the map so we can see how we're doing towards the national goal of, of actually it's a global goal for preserving 30% of, of the planet's ecosystems by 2030. Let's just talk about the US. Uh, there's no way we're going to do that unless we measure conservation on private property. So that's another important issue. There is urgency to enacting this homegrown national park solution. Um, again, 135 million acres of residential landscapes. Let's just talk about that right now. That's a big job because none of these landscapes were designed to support biodiversity. We all need to get to work. I do believe we can do it, but there are a few things we need to learn. We need to all agree if we're going to succeed. And one of those things is the four goals that every property shares. It's gotta become common knowledge that every property has to support uh, viable food webs. Every property has to be pulling more carbon out of the atmosphere than it's adding to the atmosphere. Every property is a, a member of a local watershed. So every property has to behave that way. Nobody has the ethical right to destroy your local watershed. And every property has to support pollinators. Um, lawn accomplishes none of those goals. So that's that's why our initial effort was to just shrink the area of, of lawn and we will make a lot of progress. Plant choice though, extremely important. This is burning bush, of course, uh, highly invasive species. It's not supporting any of the wildlife that we need to support. So our plant choice uh, is really important. There are three kinds of plants out there. There are plants that actually contribute energy uh, that they've captured from the sun to local food webs. You know, that's what plants do. They, they use photosynthesis to make food and they store that food in their plant parts. And that's the food that all the animals on the planet depend on. Well, if you don't get that food to the animals, you don't have any animals. And if you don't have any animals, you don't have functional food webs. Most vertebrates do not eat plants directly. Most vertebrates eat invertebrates that eat plants. Those are typically insects. So if you're gonna contribute energy to food webs, you probably have to be making a lot of insects. 
So plants that do that well are called contributors. Plants that don't do that well are called non-contributors, but they're plants that actively detract energy from local food webs. And that would be those invasive species. Best contributor in most areas of the country would be one of the oaks, contributing far more energy than other types of plants. Um, it, ginkgo biloba, great example of a non-contributor. It's not an invasive plant. It's a good ornamental. It turns nice bright yellow in the fall, but nothing eats a ginkgo. So it's it's a decoration that's, that's there, um, but it's not contributing any energy to local food webs. Uh, and any of our invasive ornamentals would be good examples of non of, of detractors. They escape into our natural areas, push out the native plants that do contribute, uh, and don't contribute anything to local food webs. We also need to gain a, a new appreciation of how important caterpillars are in those local food webs. Caterpillars, uh, they're not worms. They're not there to be squished. Um, they are contributing more energy to food webs than any other type of plant eater, transferring more energy from plants to other animals than any other type of plant eater. If we design landscapes that don't have enough caterpillars and then we're gonna have a failed food web and then eventually failed ecosystems. And that's why keystone plants are so important because keystone plants make the most caterpillars. Remember what a keystone is. It's the stone in the middle of the Roman arch. And if you take that stone out of the arch, the arch collapses. Well, if you take keystone plants out of your local food web, the food web collapses because those are the plants that are making most of the food. They're supporting 90% of the caterpillars that drive the food webs. So think of the keystone plants in your local food web as the two by fours that are holding up that food web. If you're building an ecological house outside, they're the two by fours that are holding up that house. You can't build a house out of wallpaper. And that's what we've been trying to do with our decorative plants that don't support the food web for the last hundred years. What are the best keystone plants where you live? You go to, to uh, Native Plant Finder, the National Wildlife Federation website, put in your zip code and the ranked list of the most productive plants, woody plants and herbaceous plants for your county will pop up. These are just uh, examples. It's much, much longer list than this. We have to think about all the advice that E.O. Wilson gave us over the years. And probably the most important one was that insects are the little things that run the world. He published that paper in 1987 and convincingly demonstrated if you remove insects from planet Earth, you remove us. You remove all the vertebrates, you remove 90% of the plants, Insects are vital. And if we're gonna restore insect populations, we have to understand host plant uh, specificity. We have to understand that most of the insects that eat plants are host plant specialists. Uh, and you're not gonna have them in your, your yard unless you provide the plant on which they have specialized. And they specialize because plants don't wanna be eaten. They protect themselves with nasty chemicals and the insects have to adapt to those chem chemicals before they can eat the plant which is what of course has happened with the monarch butterfly. Monarch butterfly, beautiful uh, butterfly with a wonderful migration and we all love the monarch, which is red listed by the way now. But it's a perfect example of host plant specialization. We know that it needs milkweeds. That's all it's going to develop on. Milkweeds are toxic plants. How can a monarch eat a toxic plant? Well, it has developed the enzymes that store and excrete and detoxify cardiac glycosides. That's the primary defensive component of, of milkweeds. They also have sticky latex sap. That's what gives them the, the common name of milkweed. And monarchs have the behavioral adaptations that allow them to block the flow of, of that sap. Um, so because of those physiological and behavioral adaptations, monarchs get to eat a plant that is unavailable to most other insects. Well, 90% of the insects that eat plants are just like the monarch. They're specialized on other species of plants, which is why when we bring plants in from other continents, it doesn't support any of those, those species. We have to understand how important pollinators are. Now, we're, we've made a lot of progress there. A lot of people know that we've got pollinator crisis. They all think of the honeybee, but we've got 4,000 species of native bees. Pretty much all of them are in decline. Uh, but the, everybody hears the only reason we need pollinators is because they pollinate a third of our crops. I don't like that, that explanation. Um, it's very anthropocentric. Uh, it's also not true. 
Uh, May Berenbaum, University of Illinois, did a, a study looking for where we got that third of our crops figure. She couldn't find it anywhere, and she made her own calculations. And based on our current diet, it's about a twelfth of our crops that depend on, on pollinators. Uh, but I still don't like that argument because people say, well, I don't live next to a farm, so I don't need pollinators. You do need pollinators, whether you live next to a farm or not, because they're pollinating 80% of all plants and 90% of all flowering plants. If we lost our pollinators, we lose 80 to 90% of the plants on the planet, and that is not an option wherever you live. We want to develop an appreciation of the importance of leaf litter. It's not just something messy that you need to throw away. And if you do throw away, you're throwing away the nutrients that those trees that made the leaves need in following years, in future years. Uh, they're all tied up in that, that leaf litter, and it's got to be degraded and, and um, returned to the soil by all of the soil creatures that are in there. That's their, that's their role. Um, and it forms a blanket over the soil to protect the humidity that all of those soil creatures need. There are more species that live in the soil than above the soil. So, uh, and they're the ones transferring nutrients to our plants. They're extremely important. Bare soil is an ecological no-no. And the best um, mulch that you can possibly have is leaf litter. The people say, well, I can't keep the leaves in my beds because flowers can't, can't grow through them. Um, that's not true. Now, if you pile five feet of leaves on your bed, yes, then it is true. But a normal layer of leaf litters uh, doesn't, just try it. Your plants will pop right through. Uh, and there's a ton of examples of that. So nourish your trees, then put a layer of green mulch, living plants over those leaf litter. And you've, you've got a wonderful uh, ecological situation for the trees and for the things that live in those trees. We have to understand the role that light pollution is, is playing in uh, killing our insects. We've lost 45% of the insects on planet Earth and light pollution is one of the major causes of that. Of course, it's pretty easy to turn out lights, but we don't like to do that. So um, one thing you can do is replace the white bulbs that are in your, your uh, security light in your front porch or over your barn or over your garage with a yellow bulb. Yellow LED, yellow incandescent, yellow wavelengths are far less attractive to nocturnal insects, particularly the moths that make the caterpillars that run our, our ecosystems. Um, if we got rid of our, our white bulbs uh, overnight, we could save millions of insects. And if we use LEDs, we could save millions of dollars as well. Mosquito fogging, booming uh, business around the country. Um, and it isn't just another ecological disaster. Um, and of course, the mosquito foggers say, well, it, it's okay because we are fogging a natural product. And they are. It's pyrethroids made by chrysanthemums. It's industrial strength pyrethroids. Uh, and they think because it's natural, it's okay. Cyanide is natural. Uh, it's not okay. Ricin is natural. That's not okay either. Um, nicotine, there's a whole bunch of, of nasty compounds that plants make. So being natural it's not a good argument. They also say incorrectly, completely incorrectly, that it only kills mosquitoes. Not so. It kills all the insects that um, it comes in contact with, including our monarchs, including our, our pollinators. And look, it comes in contact with all of the insects that are out there. The interesting thing is it doesn't control mosquitoes. In order to control mosquitoes uh, in the adult stage, and that's what they're targeting, you have to kill 90% of them. Uh, mosquito fogging kills between 10 and 50%. So it's not even close to being functional. Uh, this is the result of mosquito fogger. Uh, a friend of mine on the Eastern shore of Maryland went and picked up the dead monarchs after they came through. Um, and of course, this is a monarch. It's red listed now. We're trying to save this thing. Do not hire a mosquito fogger. If you really want to control your mosquitoes, try biocontrol with mosquito dunks. Get a bucket, fill it full of water, Put in a handful of straw or hay and let it let it uh, expose it to the sun for a few days. It will build up populations of diatoms and algae, and that is what mosquito larvae eat. This becomes a very attractive brew to female mosquitoes that want to lay their eggs. They will preferentially lay their eggs in your bucket, and you go to the hardware store and you buy a sheet of mosquito dunks. Bacillus thuringiensis, this formulation, it only kills aquatic diptera, and the only aquatic diptera in your bucket is the mosquito larva. If a dragonfly gets in here, it won't hurt it. If your dog drinks it, it won't hurt it. So it's very targeted, it's cheap. And if everybody did it, it would work. 
And people, you know, worry is, is controlling mosquitoes going to hurt our birds? You know, most of the mosquitoes giving us problems um, are things like the Asian tiger mosquito or Aedes aegypti. Where do you think that came from? These are invasive species we brought over here. Um, so, uh, no, it's not going to hurt her, her birds. Um, we, if we have viable habitats, if we're doing all the other things we're talking about, getting rid of, of these invasive mosquitoes is not going to be a problem. Uh, another thing we want to think about is how important small properties are. 82% of us live in cities and they think, well, I, you know, my property is too small. I can't do anything. Pam Carlson, you probably all know Pam, lives in, in Chicago. One tenth of an acre, um, very pretty one tenth of an acre because Pam is a good uh, native plant landscaper. Three times smaller than the average lot size in North America, uh, but she has recorded 124 birds using her her uh, property. So even though she's an isolated little patch, wildlife still uses it. And if you don't have any property at all, you live in an apartment complex or, or you know you're just in the middle of a city. Container gardening becomes very effective. Container gardening with native plants. And you can find out more about this on our website, homegrownnationalpark.org, which will tell you which plants are best in different areas of the country. Um, they're very, very uh, important resources for uh, our native bees, for the migrating monarch, for the things that need pollen and nectar in cities. Um, picture an apartment complex that is, you know, it's a pile of bricks, but if every patio, if every balcony was loaded with container plants that were blooming, it would be a valuable resource to local pollinators. Now, fortunately, we do have a silver bullet in our fight against climate change and the biodiversity crisis, and that is that conservation works. Nature is extremely resilient. The Natchusa grasslands, you've probably heard of it, 3,800 acres in Illinois. There's more than 730 native plant species there. 180 species of birds, 180 species of birds that used to be a cornfield. So conservation works on a large scale. It works on a smaller scale too. This is a, a, our property right here in Oxford, Pennsylvania. It was mowed for hay when we moved in. Uh, of course, when you take it out of mowing all of the invasive species that you have been mowing, and in our case, that was a lot of things return. And this is what our property looked like when we actually moved in, 10 acres of uh, honeysuckle and autumn olive and multiflora rose and oriental bittersweet. Um, it was a jungle. We could hardly walk through it. Uh, so it's necessary to, to remove that stuff. And a lot of people, you know, balk. They say, well, that's way too big a job. I can't do it. Look, this is my wife, Cindy. She's a little skinny. She did it. If Cindy can do it, you can do it. Or hire somebody to, to do it. Uh, and after you remove that stuff, you get to put the plants back. And that's that's what we've done. Um, and I have been counting the number of moth species, those things that run the food web, the bread and butter of our, of our uh, local terrestrial food webs. I've been counting the number, I'm taking pictures of the number of moth species that are now using our property for the last five years. And I am up to 1,202 species of moths. I added another species last night. It's always very exciting because we put the plants that those species need back. So the, the restoration is still happening at our place. Uh, and these are these are interesting creatures like the chinkapin leaf miner, the skullcap skeletonizer, the neighbor. They've got great names. The little devil, the horrid zelly, the scallop sallow, the obtuse yellow, the explicit arches, and, and yes, there is an implicit arches as well. The snowy shouldered eclaris, the grateful midget, the pink shaded fern moth, the scribbler, the lemon plagotus, showy emerald, the green marvel. Harris's three spot, the bride, the eyed pectes, which eats poison ivy, by the way. Poison ivy is a good plant. The tufted bird dropping moth. Who wouldn't want the tufted bird dropping moth? And this is my favorite, the spun glass caterpillar. Uh, and of course, hundreds of other species have come to the plants that are on our, our property. And, and you know, when I tell people that, I say, well, geez, you're going to be defoliated. All these caterpillars are eating, eating uh, all of your plants. That doesn't happen. Why not? because they're food. All, so many other things are eating these caterpillars, the birds. We have 61 species of birds that breed on our property now because we've got the caterpillars that support that breeding. They are eating hundreds and hundreds of caterpillars every single day. I'm amazed that I have any caterpillars left. 
We've also got a lot of predatory insects. We've got ambush bugs. We've got assassin bugs. We've got predatory stink bugs. This guy sat next to this aggregation of, of uh, milkweed tussock moth, uh, eating one a day. Uh, and believe me, the, the aggregation got smaller in just a few days. Then we got a ton of parasitoids, uh, hundreds of species of parasitoids hitting those caterpillars all the time. And we've got predatory wasps that sting the caterpillars and carry them off to their nest and lay their eggs on them. It's, it's nature's way of refrigeration because these guys, once they're paralyzed, they're not dead, so they don't rot. And then the eggs can hatch and, and eat them alive. And we've got vertebrates, we've got skunks, we've got possums, we've got raccoons, they all eat insects. Foxes, 25% of a fox's diet is insects. And we've got amphibians, we've got, we've got spring peepers, we've got toads, we've got salamanders, we've got ringneck snakes. And we've got the cutest little green tree frogs, actually gray tree frogs, they're green when they're little, that you ever did see. All of these things are eating insects at our house. So we talked about lawn. Um, and it's a great place to start, but our lawn goals are too modest. We can't stop just with 20 million acres. The country is much bigger than that. Most of our privately owned land is actually in small woodlots, cropland, or rangeland. So let's talk about each one of those briefly. We have 406 million acres of woodlots managed by private citizens, not logging companies in this country. And how they're managed is going to determine their biodiversity value. How they are by managed, we're talking about logging, they are taking logs out. Um, and how we're controlling the invasive species load in these, these places. Uh, <coughs> excuse me. There are organizations um, that have studied sustainable forest management, like the Foundation for Sustainable Forests in Western Pennsylvania, but there's other organizations around the country. And they have um, demonstrated how effective um, sustainable forest management can be. There's two kinds of, of logging in these private woodlots. High grade harvesting, where you take the best, best trees and leave the rest. And worse first, you take the rest and leave the best trees. Um, high grade foresting gives you or, or harvesting gives you a great harvest once uh, and then you're done maybe for 80 years. So it's essentially a one one shot deal. Worse first, where you're taking smaller, um, uh, less perfect uh, trees, you're doing it more often, uh, but you're leaving the, the great trees that reforest that creates higher yields uh, over time and it does it in, indefinitely. Um, so that's definitely the way we ought to be managing our, our woodlots because you end up with functional woodlots essentially forever. But most of those woodlots are invaded with, with non-native plants. How are we going to manage those? Well, the key to managing invasive plants in our natural areas is to start with the thing that has made them invasive. Uh, again, under underappreciated, but overabundance of deer are creating tremendous ecological problems, including exacerbating the invasive species problem because the deer do not like uh, non-native plants any more than our insects do. They don't eat them. So they eat all the natives, they remove the understory, uh, the regeneration in forests, uh, and unless you ex exclude them, and that's what this uh, is showing here, um, you end up with, with this. Uh, but they don't eat the non-natives, so they don't eat the burning bush and the buckthorn and all those other things. And that's what tips the competitive balance against our natives. We've got to get the deer back down below the carrying capacity. They, um, for some reason, stilt grass goes crazy when you have a lot of deer. Asian jumping worms as well. Really serious problems are exacerbated by, by too many deer. I was recently in the Great Smoky Mountains, um, recently like uh, three weeks ago. That's what it looks like, folks. That's what an understory ought to ought to look like. There's regeneration there. Most of the understory plants are immature uh, canopy trees. And if a tree falls over, there's no problem with uh, it being replaced. Uh, and the first thing I ask them is, why? How come you don't have too many deer like the rest of us do? Uh, and he said, well, we do have deer, but we don't have too many deer. We also have a lot of black bears. We also have coyotes. We also have bobcats. Now, they don't have any wolves and they don't have any cougars, but those predators are enough to be keeping the deer population in check so that they have a viable ecosystem. We've got to control deer numbers. We can do it naturally like is happening in the Smokies, or we can provide the control ourselves. There are other serious downsides to deer overabundance. Lyme disease is certainly certainly one of them. I've had Lyme disease five times, so I get it. Um, 
But people, you know, how do you control deer? Predators, uh, you know, maybe in some places, sharpshooters, expensive. Uh, and, and, you know, let's say you've got 100 deer per square mile, you should have 10. The sharpshooters come in, have a great night, and they take 40. Well, you still have, what, 50 too many. Market hunting has been proposed by uh, Bern Blossy at Cornell. Uh, that's what they used to do in the old days. You got paid for every, you sold what you, what you hunted. It was a great way of controlling those those pesky passenger pigeons and the Carolina parakeet and the the bison, all those things that we had uh, uh, successful market hunting with. If we return to market hunting for deer, it probably would control them. What do we do in the meantime? Put a cage around those trees you're trying to restore. Uh, it's ugly, but it works. Um, why do I have this picture here? What we want to do is is uh, reduce the area of of lawn uh, that we have out there. We want to keep it uh, so that uh, it it becomes a cue for care. Um, but other areas are going to be well planted. Uh, so it demonstrates that we are actually um, we get the the current culture. We we haven't abandoned our landscape. Uh, we're not going to reduce the property value. Uh, we can make beautiful landscapes. Uh, using lawn as a cue for care. What about cropland? Cropland is not going to go away either, but there are ways we can improve the biodiversity value of, of cropland. 410 million acres of cropland uh, in, in uh, the U.S., but this is a picture, of course, of all of North America. The light area, green areas, are where the cropland is. And there's several things we can do to increase the biodiversity value. Manage the vegetation on the roadsides, which has all of a sudden become lawn. Put hedgerows back wherever possible, add prairie strips to our, our crops, uh, and limit our use of neonicotinoids, uh, insecticides, particularly when they don't provide any value. The monarch is now red listed because of a loss of, of habitat. Uh, and, and that is what happened to monarch habitat throughout the Midwest, actually all over the place. We got rid of the weeds used to be the milkweeds, the asters, the goldenrods that supported our native pollinators and the monarch and replaced it with this high status grass. Um, so this is now the, the norm uh, through most of our agricultural areas, but it could be this. And uh, Iowa is making some, some great progress in terms of returning roadsides to prairie ecosystems, extremely productive. I think they've done this for more than a thousand miles uh, of roadway in, in uh Iowa, we need to do it everywhere. And that will, if you really want to help the monarch, that's the way it's going to, going to happen. Put those hedgerows back. Uh, every, every place you have the opportunity to do that. Now, I know we have huge uh, uh, harvesting machines and planting machines, and that's been the excuse to get rid of our hedgerows. But I've seen hedgerows taken out where those machines were not, in, uh, you know, it wasn't a problem for the machines at all. It just became the culture to, to do that. So we want to put them back, but we, they have to, of course, be uh, dominated by native plants. We did a study a couple of years ago. I just a quick study with a, a uh, an undergrad in my uh, my department comparing the caterpillar community communities in hedgerows that are invaded by by non-native plants. So here you got a lot of autumn olive and multiflora rose and other things with the caterpillar communities and hedgerows that are not invaded by non-native plants. And we found a 68% reduction in the number of species of caterpillars in those hedgerows, a 91% reduction in the abundance of those caterpillars, and a 96% reduction in the biomass of those caterpillars. So if, you, if you're talking about, that's the amount of energy that's there. If you're talking about um, bird food, that's a 96% reduction in, in bird food. No wonder our birds are disappearing because we allow those non-natives to take out our natives everywhere. Prairie strips, great, again, great research happening at uh, Iowa State University. You put the prairie strips right in uh, your agricultural fields. You put it uh, perpendicular to the flow of water off the property. And not only does it provide wonderful habitat for our, our pollinators, but it also reduces topsoil loss by 95%. Significant, I mean, do it just for that. Reduces water pollution because it intercepts any extra nitrogen or phosphorus that you're putting on your field and it grabs it and holds it, keeps it out of, of the watershed. Uh, so it looks like, oh, the, the, the grower is losing a lot of land. It's supported by uh, CREP programs, USDA CREP programs. So it's, it's a win-win for everybody. Then finally, um, 
we got to fight back against neonicotinoid seed coatings. Neonicotinoids are 7,000 times more toxic uh, to insects than DDT was. Uh, and, and amazingly, we use them uh, preventively. We, we put them in our, our agriculture, whether or not you have an insect problem. So all the seeds you buy are pink. That pink coating is, is neonix. Only 5% of this product is taken up by the plant. The other 95% washes off into our watersheds where it's extremely persistent or blows away on dust uh, where we have no idea what it's, it's doing. The interesting thing is when you compare yield in crops that have seed coatings versus crops that do not, there's no increase in yield. So we're doing it for nothing. Um, we need to stop doing that. Okay, finally, rangeland. Most of the country is in rangeland, 770 million acres of rangeland, four and a half times the size of Texas, uh, which is allocated to, to grazing. Uh, but you know, our grasslands, grasslands all over the world, co-evolved with grazers. Grass is, is an invention. It's a plant invention uh, to be able to uh, not be killed by grazers. The meristem is at the base of the plant, so they can, top of the plant can be eaten and the plant does not die. This is an experimental range in Nebraska that Cindy and I visited, uh, and it was a, a, a hopping place there. Those are cattle. Those are not bison. Be great if they were bison, but they're cattle, and that's okay. These are all sunflowers. All the plants were there. All the prairie uh, birds were there. Um, highly diverse place because there were not too many cattle, uh, and because the cattle are kept out of the water. This is probably the the worst thing, believe it or not, in our our arid uh, rangelands is that cattle are given access to the streams themselves. They totally degrade them. Uh, to the point where the the uh, cottonwoods and willows that support most of the biodiversity in those areas are eliminated. You get water erosion and everything else. So simple fences, keep the cows out, uh, and you can really increase the biodiversity value of your rangeland. Okay, there's something that's common to each one of these conservation approaches, and that is whether or not they succeed depends on decisions that you and I make. I had a student uh, in, in my class last year. Uh, she was answering a final exam and very wisely she said, well, conservationists claim to be managing species and habitats. What we're really managing is people. This is Amanda Crandall. Um, and that's right, we're managing people. We know the science that's gonna increase biodiversity. So these are people problems. These are sociological problems. We're talking about changing our culture and changing culture is difficult. Right now, we've got an adversarial relationship with nature. We've got to change it to a collaborative one. We've got to convince people that we all need nature. Can we do this? Well, I think we can. Uh, and it doesn't mean you have to save biodiversity for a living. You can save it where you live, though. You can save it where you farm, where you, where you graze. And if you do, it empowers you. A lot of people are, are, are understanding. They're coming to realize that the earth has some serious problems, but they all feel powerless. What can one person do? Well, one person can do all the things we just talked about. We can shrink the lawn. We can modify our light system. We can add a pollinator garden. We can remove invasive plants from our properties. We can use keystone plants. We can fire our mosquito fogger. We can join Homegrown National Park. There are a lot of things a single person can do. Uh, and, and it shrinks the challenge down to something that's manageable. Don't think about the entire planet's problems. You get depressed. Just worry about the piece of the earth that you can that you can influence. If you own property, it's obvious. That's where you start. If you don't own property, uh, volunteer. Help somebody who does. Our parks and our preserves, all of our land conservancy are underfunded. Uh, they're understaffed. They'll love you as a volunteer. So we hope that Homegrown National Park will provide the motivation and the guidance for millions of people. Millions, a great workforce to tackle these conservation problems. Whether or not we do is going to determine nature's fate and then ultimately our own fate. So please get yourself on the map, join Homegrown National Park. Thanks very much. And thank you, Dr. Tell me. Um, wow. Um, you packed so much into um, one hour that um, I want to reassure everyone that you can go back and watch the, the video again and, and pick up the details this time. You didn't memorize all that? <laughs> <laughs> I was trying to take notes and you'd move so fast that I, I missed some things. So yes, there's there's um, plenty of opportunities to, to revisit this and I encourage you to do that. 
Um, it's funny that you mentioned Natusa grasslands because we had a program all about Natusa two weeks ago. Oh, great. I, I wish I'd seen it. <laughs> um, well, it's on our YouTube channel uh, uh, if you would like to uh, catch it. And that's that, of course, goes for anybody who's watching this, um, the, the GPL YouTube channel available through our website. Um, so um, I just wanted to go over um, one thing, which is um, somebody had asked me earlier today, actually, um, whether uh, Homegrown National Park offers some kind of yard sign so that if you decide to go this, this excellent route, um, you can let your neighbors know that what you're doing is intentional and you're not being a bad neighbor. Um, and the, the answer is yes, the, the HMP um, website has a downloadable yard sign that you can get for free and it will tell people that what you're doing is, is, um, is the right thing to do. Um, so having said that, um, I'm going to go to a couple of questions now. Um, somebody, the, the first question is, um, how can we get homeowners associations to accept the need for biodiversity? There are so many that don't appreciate or allow native gardens. Yeah, that's that's one of the most challenging aspects of our culture change. Uh, there's a couple of things we can do. Uh, the most effective is to join your homeowners association so that you become a knowledgeable voice. These people are they just don't understand these the rules they're following were designed typically back in the 70s or whenever the the neighborhood was created uh to maintain property values to make sure you didn't have rusting cars in your front front yard everybody wants to live in a high high class uh, neighborhood and these are the rules that's going to make it high high class and then they started including the way we landscape in in those rules everything had to be uniform the lawn, of course, was accepted as the status symbol. <clears throat> so we want to use the, the things I talked about. You want to reduce the area that's in lawn, but so you're not getting rid of lawn. You're keeping the lawn, um, some parts of the lawn, as a cue for care. And it should be manicured. It should be mowed regularly. That's not where your biodiversity is going to reside. We need to create examples so that the Homeowners Association can see it's not going to reduce property values. Uh, and they need to be educated about the biodiversity crisis and how we cannot exclude nature from all of our, our uh, living spaces. Uh, and I'm getting emails from people who said, I joined my homegrown, my, my homeowners association, and it works. They've changed their rules. They're people, these, these rules are being relaxed all over the country. Uh, there are people that, that uh, are taking more direct approach. They're suing their homeowners association. You probably saw the uh, headline in the New York Times maybe two months ago called I fought the lawn and the lawn lost. And it was a couple in Maryland that sued their HOA and they won. Um, you know, I'm, I'm not a litigious guy and I don't think that's a, a great approach, but there is now a legal precedent for home for HOAs. They might, you know, hesitate before they get too serious about pushing back. Uh, but the best way to do it is to say, look, give me a chance. Let me do this. I'll show you I am not going to reduce the the uh, you know the aesthetic value of my property. And it should be much less of a problem. Thank you. Uh, okay, here's a question. Um, how somebody wants Shelley wants to know, how do plants get pollinated when they grow inside a greenhouse? Well, <laughs> the plants that need pollination that way, so, for example, tomatoes that are grown in a greenhouse, they bring in uh, domesticated colonies of bumblebees. Uh, and it's been a disaster, really, because those colonies came from Europe and they brought bumblebee diseases with them. And then those colonies uh, escaped out into nature. And so species like the rusty patch bumblebee, uh, Bombus pennsylvanicus, um, it's that lineage of bumblebee that's very sensitive to that disease that those those domesticated bumblebees brought in. Uh, and that's probably why they've disappeared so fast is a disease issue. Um, so we're hoping that there's enough resistance out there that they can bounce back. But um, they are pollinated by insects and, and uh, it, it can lead to problems. Right. Thank you. A couple questions about leaf litter. Um, people want to know if we let leaves lie on the ground from autumn through early spring and then remove them, 
are we helping the butterflies and moths through the winter, but then are we hurting them when we remove the leaf litter in the spring? Should we just leave the leaves there year round? Yes. Um, <clears throat> but of course, the lawn you're keeping, you're not going to leave leaf litter there. So the time to, to rake it gently uh, is when they fall right away in the fall and put them where they're going to be. Uh, and again, I tell the story of my son who brought a, bought a house a couple of years ago. And the first fall, he called me up and he said, he said, dad, I've got too many leaves. What should I do with them? And I said, put them in your flower beds. And he said, I don't have enough flower beds. And I said, exactly. Create new flower beds. That's how that's the best way to start a new flower bed is load it with leaves and then plant right through it the next spring, uh, because that will help smother the grass. You don't have to go into the herbicide uh, routine. Um, there are cases where you've got so many big trees that you have more leaves that can fit in, in a reasonable way into your flower beds. Then you create a, a compost heap uh, and you can distribute that, that compost uh, as, as fertilizer later on. Um, so, you know, piling leaves on top of each other in a compost heap, is that gonna hurt the insects? Yes, probably, but you're saving as many as you can. You know, when I was growing up, we raked them to the curb and we burned them along with everything else. And I actually have fond memories of that. I love that smell, but <laughs> we don't do that anymore. And it's, and it's good that we don't. Excellent practical advice. Thank you. Um, uh, Hall wants to know, are local ordinances required to allow this concept? Um, in many places, no. Sorry, not, this is not about leaf litter. This is about homegrown natural. Homegrown natural, but you don't, you don't have to tell anybody. Plant an oak tree. Do you need an ordinance to allow you to do that? No. This is where you can use property rights. This is your property. You have the right to do good things on it too. You don't need permission to do that. The only the pushback you're going to get uh, typically is at the homeowner association level, a very very local level. Sometimes civic associations, you know, townships will will they've got um, these nuisance laws. So there are laws in the book that says if you if you let vegetation grow in your property, you're going to have rats. Not at all true. You know, there's no data supporting any of this nonsense. You're going to have vermin, whatever that is. Um, so uh, sometimes you get pushback on that level, but a lot of these townships are uh, relaxing that. When we, as, as voting members of our communities, make it known that this is an important issue to us, uh, and we make it known at the mayor level, saying, if you don't support this in our township, you're not going to get elected again. Believe me, it'll happen. Elected officials want to be reelected, and they, they're simply doing what the, the squeakiest wheel says to do, which is usually just a few people. So we have to be a little squeakier on the positive side, uh, and then they'll relax these rules. Thank you. Um, question from Beth, who's a prominent environmental leader around here. Um, hello, Beth. Um, she wants to know, if, have you heard of a way in creating to create large prairie installations or restorations without using first, first using glyphosate, also known as Roundup, to kill the invasive weeds that are there as the first step? You know, it depends on what's there. Uh, usually the hardest thing is getting rid of the grass that you have there. And uh, Larry Weiner, who's a, a prominent uh, native plant meadow maker back in the East, <clears throat> has told me you can actually shift the plant composition toward uh, native bunch grasses simply with your mowing schedule. You mow heavily in the spring uh, and then don't mow again the rest of the year. And you do that two or three years in a row. And of course, it suppresses the growth of the cool season European grasses and supports the growth of the, the warm season uh, native bunch grasses that come in. So simply by changing your mowing schedule, you can push it uh, in a more native direction. And also the, the forbs will, will start to come in as well. Now, if you've got a, a terrible invasive problem uh, and you can name any number of them, particularly the woodies, mowing is never gonna control the woodies. You've gotta kill the root system. Um, and, and for most of these things, woody plants, glyphosate's not the answer. That's a foliar spray, uh, and it kills everything it comes in contact with. So uh, herbicides are an effective tool in our, our conservation toolbox when they're used effectively. And this is a good example of, of, of um, where stump cutting is really effective. Now, now, 
if you have things generally under control and these things recolonize every year, and they do as little guys, go around with your mattock, a few wax, and out they come. You don't have to use any any herbicides at all. And that includes, you know, plants that are seven, eight feet tall. A mattock is a wonderful tool and it, it really gets those root systems out of there. But, you know, if your problem's bigger than that, you've got to kill the root system. You don't want to do it a hundred times. Oriental bittersweet, for example, just cutting it off at the base is not going to kill it. It'll come up the rest of your life. So you really want to paint the stumps with an oil-based herbicide, not Roundup, uh, to kill that, that root system. Uh, and the, the, it's, it's a greater good uh, effect here. The, the, the benefit of getting rid of the oriental bittersweet far outweighs the negatives of, of using uh, that herbicide once. Can, can you give a couple of um, brand names for the oil-based? I use Garlon. Okay. All right. Thanks. Um, at this point, I want to mention um, that um, there is a great need for volunteers in this area and throughout the country, of course, to help create and maintain native plant gardens in your community. Um, some of the ones right around Glencoe are the Friends of the Green Bay Trail. Um, there are the for forest preserve districts in Lake County and Cook County. There's Gilson Park. Um, there's nature conservancy properties up in Lake Forest um, and many other native garden areas in our communities. Go Green is a great community or a great organization in, with which to start. Um, Friends of the Green Bay Trail and, um, and many others, of course. So, um, please get out there and do what you can, not only in your own property, but but as well as some, some of these common properties. Um, it's, uh, a man named Carl um, says, thanks for the referral to the National Wildlife Federation's Native Plant Finder. It's fantastic, he says. Um, and he wants to know if there's sort of a flip side version of that um, for non-native plants that would state in effect, how few butterflies and moths use them. <laughs> For example, he's read that the butterfly bush supports only one butterfly in Southern California. Um, um, do you have any idea where to access information like this on say hostas? Does such uh, a place like this exist? <laughs> well, uh, yeah, I actually do, but it's not, it's not published. We have ah. records for host, host use for every genus of plant in every county throughout the country. Uh, and and by we, I mean Kimberly Shrupshire is my my research assistant. And she's compiled this uh, and and we're going to publish it as this giant, giant website that people can go to. Uh, but she hasn't gotten around to it yet. It's going to take about three weeks to to get it published, and she's doing another huge project with a deadline. Um, so people are asking for this, and it will be up. I hope it's up by the end of the summer, but we'll see. Thank you. Uh, Linda just has a comment. She says, fabulous, ongoing HNP. Thank you. You have such a wonderful manner for encouraging people to drop the excuses and guilt and take a small step. Well, I like that. Drop the excuses. Mm -hmm. That's good. <laughs> yeah, I like it too. Um, all right. Um, let's see. I'm I'm toggling between the Q&A and the, and the chat. Um, so, oh my, there's a lot of questions here. <laughs> <laughs> can, can we do a few more? Sure, yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, can you talk about your new version of Nature's Best Hope for middle school students? Right, the young, read, run, young readers version. Um, it, it is designed to get the same message that's in Nature's Best Hope. It really, there's almost nothing left out. Uh, make it more a little bit more accessible for, for young readers. Um, you know, we say middle school, uh, parts of it, are written for kids that are younger than them. They're, you know, there are eight and nine year olds who who are totally capable of reading that and, and absorbing everything. Uh, and the goal is to get the message that these kids are the future steward of the planet to the kids who are the future stewards of the planet. Right now, most of what they hear about nature is scary. Uh, it's going to hurt you. Uh, you know, it's fear mongering by the the media, um, and we've got to combat that and and get them to realize. You know, they really are. They're very important in the future of conservation. And there are things they can do. They can find an acorn. They can plant it. They can get permission from their parents. They can convince their parents to, to maybe put in a pollinator garden. Kids are very effective uh, um, lobbyists with their, their parents. But it's really, it's a matter of taking the message uh, to all the people 
that are out there, including our, our kids. Thank you. Um, Becky wants to know, is HNP working with corporate owners to consider taking lawns out of their campuses, those vast, vast lawns? Yeah, um, you know, I've done some talks with with uh, big corporations. Um, not, a lot more needs to be done. <clears throat> Homegrown National Park is not very many people. Uh, somebody wanted to visit our headquarters the other day. There is no headquarters. It's our, it's our bedroom, you know. It's, <laughs> um, so there's a lot of wonderful ideas, reaching the box stores, reaching corporations, you know, going international. We do have Canada on the map now, by the way. Um, these are all wonderful things that we want to do in the future. We did just hire an executive director, uh, and that will lighten the load, uh, particularly on Michelle. Uh, so we're moving in that direction. But remember, we don't charge to be in Homegrown National Park, which means we have no income. Uh, and that does limit uh, what we can do. It's all based on, on donations. Um, so if you want to see us do a whole lot, do a whole lot more, you, you're going to have to send us some money. That's what it boils down to. Done. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I um I think we've we've asked a lot of you, and I appreciate your time. I'm going to end with one nice comment from someone who says, "Dr. T, I'm eternally grateful for the detailed work that you and your colleagues have done for decades. You've given me a great platform of information to move forward from. I stand on your shoulders in deep, deep appreciation." Well, that that is wonderful. Thank you very much. <laughs> that was very nice. That was from anonymous. Um, so, so yes, thank you, thank you so much, Dr. Tommy, and um, um, we will watch your progress with great, great interest here. And thank you very much. Thanks for the opportunity. Take care, Bye, everyone. Mm -hmm.